now we move into the uh, pulmonary circuit, and uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Hiresi Devella, who will be talking about pulmonary embolism response team. Thank you very much. Good morning. It's, uh, great, to be, yeah. it's great to be here. Uh, I'd like to thank for uh, the invitation to speak. I am a pulmonary and critical care physician at the Cleveland Clinic, and I've been asked to speak about pulmonary embolism response teams, or so-called PERTs specifically to answer two questions. How do they operate and why do we need them? But I figure I would like to start by answering the question, what are they? There is no established consensus definition, but there is an emerging uh, opinion about what these teams should look like. They should be multidisciplinary in nature. They should have a centralized, unique activation uh, process. These teams should be able to offer rapid assessment and risk stratification of patients presented with acute pulmonary embolism. And at the same time, they should be able to craft an individualized treatment approach and equally important, help implement whatever therapeutic strategy is recommended. In June this year, the third annual meeting at the of the PERT consortium took place in Boston, where more than 180 teams, mostly from the US, but also across the world, got together and shared their experiences with their own local PERT teams. So this is clearly an initiative that has, that has gained tremendous momentum and certainly has uh, gained a lot of traction in, in the US in particularly, and it seems like it's expanding uh, to the rest of the world. So why do we need these teams? Well, first of all, as you all know, the treatment options for acute pulmonary embolism are, are all over the place. And not only we have several different options, but each of these are performed by different teams, by different specialties. So you have ER physicians and intensivists doing systemic thrombolytic therapy. You have interventional cardiologists, interventional radiologists, and in some institutions, vascular surgeons doing catheter-based procedures. Of course, you have cardiothoracic surgeons doing surgical embolectomy, participating in ECMO. So there is really a, a wide variety of stakeholders in, in place. Furthermore, the best treatment approach uh, is not known. There is no standard approach. And the guidelines, as you know, really do not provide very clear guidance as to what to do uh, particularly with intermediate uh, risk or so-called submassive PE. Practice uh, varies widely by medical service, location, and size. There is no consistency in decision making. And before the advent of these teams, there was no single team and no centralized locations for care, which led to sort of the absence of centers of excellence. And finally, uh, we don't have until now or we didn't have until now, a way to systematically evaluate our practice and come up with uh, improvements. This has led to treatment gaps in pulmonary embolism where a minority of patients receive uh, advanced therapies, and it is believed that a larger proportion of these patients should probably receive these therapies. The reasons are several, but include failure to recognize potential benefit and integrate data in real time. Fear of complications, of course, particularly with the most aggressive therapies, the uh, fear of intracerebral hemorrhage. Inability to respond rapidly to the evaluation of these patients, and of course, this is a systems issues, uh, issue. And finally, this all leads to paralysis in decision making. So how do these teams can potentially overcome some of these issues? Again, uh, they, they have to be multidisciplinary. In our institution, we spend a fair amount of time getting together a core group of people, identifying uh, motivated uh, experts with interest and expertise in pulmonary embolism from dis different disciplines. In my institution, there's, heavily, uh, there's heavy representation from vascular medicine, pulmonary and critical care, interventional cardiology, interventional radiology, cardiothoracic surgery, with uh, extensive interactions with the ER, uh, chest radiology, internal medicine, and also more recently, uh, ph uh, pharmacies, hematologists. It's a large team of motivated people that have to participate. We spent a fair amount of time going through the literature, and we crafted what we think is the algorithm 
to treat pulmonary embolism, recognizing that neither this or any other algorithm is going to capture all the complexities of, of decision making, and also recognizing that this is going to be an alive document where over time, as we learn, uh, it, it's bound to be uh, modified. We also spend a fair amount of time educating uh, key areas in the hospital to tell them what PERT is and what is not and what kind of patient we uh, can provide help with. Specifically, we, of course, are interested in patients with severe pulmonary embolism as defined in various ways. As we anticipated, and it has borne out in some early experience, most of these patients will come through the emergency room and the intensive care units, but some of the calls that we have come from the regular nursing floors and uh, radiology, et cetera. We decided that only MDs, uh, PAs, NPs with a close knowledge of uh, the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism uh, were the ones that were able to activate this team. We do have a centralized uh, pager system uh, to PERT that uh, is answered by uh, vascular medicine or a pulmonary critical care fellow. But at the same time, every member in the team gets notified in our phones when the pager goes off. During the day, the vascular medicine fellow, during the night, the palm crit fellow assesses the patient uh, rapidly and gathers the data that we need for risk certification and decision making. This uh, should happen within 90 minutes of the original uh, team's activation. Then there is a second group page that goes and advises the team that a virtual meeting is going to take place. We do get together uh, via online software meeting. Uh, we started with GoToMeeting, but now we're doing Skype business. Uh, so we have this virtual meeting where every uh, member of the team, or as many as are available, get together, review the images, review the case, hear the presentation, and then basically we provide the recommendations to the primary care team and to the patient, and we reach a consensus as to what we want to do. And then importantly, the PER team helps implement those recommendations. For example, if it is decided that surgical embolectomy is the way to go, then the primary team doesn't have to do anything else. The cardiothoracic surgeon in the team will activate the OR and mobilize the resources necessary to take that patient to the operating room. Similarly, if the cath lab needs to be activated, the virtual OR, the interventional suite, all of those things happen without any further effort from the primary team. The PER team takes care of that. There is some early experience now uh, from the uh, U.S. through the PERT Consortium. This is a, a survey uh, uh, done by the research committee of the PERT Consortium where 22 out of, 30, out of 31 teams responded to an online survey. And you can see there was some variation in how the teams are structured, but the majority of them are heavily represented by pulmonary and critical care physicians, interventional radiology, and emergency medicine experts. Uh, also with important participation from cardiac surgery, interventional radiology, and non-interventional cardiology. The group from uh, Max General uh, actually is the first uh, PERT team. They have already published their experience with 314 confirmed PEs over a period of 30 months. This is the distribution. They had a fair amount of low-risk patients, uh, but this is how their team operates. It's a bit different than, than ours. Intermediate risk was just under uh, 50%, and high-risk patients were about a quarter of their experience. Interestingly, anticoagulation alone was the recommended strategy in, in about 69% of the cases, but they did offer lysis, some form of lysis, to 11% uh, of their cohort. Their overall all-cause 30-day mortality was about 12%, and of course, not surprisingly, much higher in those with massive PE, uh, compared to submassive and, and low-risk PE. We have presented our experience at uh, CHEST last year. The manuscript is, is almost done. Uh, 112 patients over a period just under two years. 70% uh, of the patients had RV strain by echo, and you can see some other features there. Our uh, distribution of uh, severity, 20% uh, were high risk, 68% were intermediate risk, 12% were low risk. Our overall mortality was 8.9%. Uh, 
But as other studies have shown, uh, only uh, three or six percent uh, of these deaths were PE related. Uh, six patients were uh, patients with terminal illnesses that require hospice cares, including one here in the low risk, which accounts for the mortality in the low risk category. These are the uh, therapies that the team implemented, and similar to the MGH experience, uh, the majority of patients actually ended up being treated with anticoagulation alone, but a sizable proportion of patients received some form of lysis uh, via uh, systemic vein or catheter-directed and, and other interventions. Uh, major bleeding occur in uh, overall 12.5% of patients, but one of the things that we observe in our early experience is that we did not observe any bleeding using systemic thrombolysis. Uh, and actually, if you look back and look at our published experience in our own institution with uh, almost 100 patients treated with systemic TPA, our major bleeding rate was 45%. And so at least in our institution, there seems to be an early benefit where uh, more careful patient selection may lead to less bleeding complications. We are looking now into outcomes before and after the PERT team implementation. We don't have that data yet. And in terms of therapies implemented uh, according to uh, uh, PE severity, uh, I would just uh, highlight here that for intermediate risk PE, actually the majority of patients, 55% of them, were treated with anticoagulation alone. Uh, but again, you know, a sizable minority received some form of early reperfusion. And of course, the vast majority of high-risk PE uh, patients uh, underwent some, some form of early reperfusion therapy. So to conclude then, the perks of PERT, uh, these teams provide rapid bedside evaluation and risk stratification of patients presented with acute pulmonary embolism. Uh, they importantly help interpret uh, the recommendations from currently now three uh, different set of guidelines uh, and apply that to the individual uh, context. In my opinion, one of the uh, biggest advantages of these teams is that they facilitate access to advanced therapies and they help implement those therapies without effort from the teams taking care of these patients. And finally, uh, I think one of the uh, major advantages of having this national consortium is that we are going to be able to generate data uh, uh, both observational and in the future, hopefully, uh, control randomized data to help us uh, improve the care of these patients. With that, uh, thank you, and i um, uh, happy to answer any questions during the panel discussion.